so um yeah as a creative person it felt so collaborative and i think that that's what people are are missing is that ai is not going to do all the things it still very much needs a person to help guide it and the yeah. more creative we can be uh with the way we think and the way we can describe what we want the more rich the outcome will be Welcome to the Spark of Splendor podcast, where we celebrate everything creative about you. How are you doing, Mr. Fresh? Oh, I'm feeling great on this beautiful Friday, getting ready. It's been a productive week, lots of creativity, lots of efficiency and productivity, and ready also for a little time this weekend to just get away from all the technology and into more social, wonderful outside activities, too. Oh outside like what kind of activities well it's i'm in southern california so it's a mm -hmm. it's like a chilly 65 degrees today so um you know we i'll find my sweatshirt my oh actually i'm wearing my sweatshirt this is about all i need for today um so we're bundled up over here um and probably get a little outside time i'm in a sort of the north valley area and it's near some beautiful hiking trails i'm taking care of my friend's doggy so it might be a nice uh, opportunity to go outside Ah, oh, that sounds really sweet. Wow. So this is, that's beautiful. I'm excited. And I'm excited to, um, we were talking a little bit as we were getting into this conversation about coming into our Ikigai, the Japanese concept of our reason for being, which is a combination of like what you love, what the world needs, what you can what you're good at and what you can be paid for and i'm nice also job. in yeah. a similar journey <laughs> you know I'm, i feel it's a good it's it's like when you're kind of fine-tuning yourself and trying to get more laser focused on like this is where i want to go and like so much clarity exactly so tell me a little bit dougie about um you know, you're a creative, you went to RISD, you've got all this like great experience, you've put on events all over Los Angeles and like really been a community leader and you bring so much light and great energy in everything you do. And I'm so grateful for you just being amazing, just being yourself. And like in the last year seeing, yeah, seeing how you've um, really been getting curious about AI and how you've been, um, you know, just doing more investigation into like, what are these tools and what can they do and what can they do for you? Yeah. So go ahead. Yeah. And I think that actually just, I wanted to touch on Ikigai uh, for a second, because I love how we started there. You know, we were talking about that before the podcast. And I, first of all, I want to, you know, commend you for remembering all four things. It's very easy to be like, oh, Ikigai. And then like, wait, what's the fourth one? <laughs> and that always usually means that you might not be in your Ikigai yet, but the fact that you've <laughs> remembered all four so clearly means that if you're not there yet you're definitely getting there and i do think oh. it's a, i do think it's a great model to think about and um what i love about it is i've seen some charts i pulled one up actually uh you know that it gives you the intersection points that like you might be missing and so I've, in my life often i have done what I, things i'm good at things that I love. I can't, I can't not do things that I love. It's really important for me just to love my projects and my clients and the things I'm working on. What the world needs, you know, I think that that's often uh, something that I've hit on with my things from producing events to um, creating platforms for thought leaders and entrepreneurs to share their genius with the world in terms of branding and web design and things like that. Uh, increasingly over the years, I've gotten better at closing in the circle, the last one, which is what you can get paid for, because the truth of the matter, and I'm looking at this chart right now, I think it's so funny, but there's the four circles, but then there's another one that has like what the, is at the intersection points that you're missing. So what you're good at, what you love, what the world needs, if you can't figure out how to get paid for it, you have delight and fullness, but no wealth, which I think is super funny. Like it's very Japanese. The way <laughs> what you love, what you're good at, what you can be paid for, but what the world doesn't need, well, what do you have? You have satisfaction, but feeling of use of uselessness. So <laughs> I think it's a great thing to, to consider. And so as I've been, you know, th thinking about that more and more, I've gone through this um, phase where I was doing the event production for a long time and almost 10 years. We had almost 200 events 
super passionate about wow. it. Yeah, thousands of attendees, hundreds of presenters. Um, yeah, this really was quite a labor of love. And we always had a bit of a hard time making the money from it. Tickets were, you know, oh, you know, we, that would often just about cover it, but not always for my time. And I was often the one doing a lot of free time. And so finally, it was so funny, 2020, we found a sponsor, UCLA. It was like, we'll sponsor a year of events. This is great. You have access to all our faculty to give talks and you can do entertainment and a bar and we'll have a budget. And I was like, wow, this is great. First event in February 2020, they loved it. They're like, great, we're going to open up the full budget now. And then March 2020, no more events, you know, with the pandemic. So oh, that was, man. oh, sometimes the cosmos has these plans for us that I just was not expecting. But the silver lining was at the time, I was actually living in a beautiful, like, um, rural setting up in Southern Oregon. I'd been come, starting to come back to LA to do events again. But I was in this peaceful place where I was able to get back in my old career of digital marketing and branding and web design. And it was a great time for uh, that business because everybody had like a web project during COVID they wanted to work on or an online store or some sort of online business. So I had such a blast during COVID and for three years, that's what I did. And I really kind of understood the whole logo to launch digital marketing journey for clients. And by the end, I was like, you know, I need to figure out what the next move is here. Cause I've been doing this for years. I'm feeling a little bit, um, little bit burned out. I, I'm pretty good these days at like figuring out what I need to change before actually getting burned out, but I can feel mm. it. I'm like, I got to get ready for this next wave. Well, the next wave, as it turns out, just what I was starting to think about that, like how I want to shift my career and work and my offerings, generative AI came into really the full public view. Uh, and that was November of last year. So here we are a year later and the things that we've seen um, in that space and how it's so massively kind of come for the fields that we weren't expecting. We were thinking like the, you know, more standard replicable fields like accounting or I don't know, taxes, maybe like those things AI would come for. We didn't expect, I think, as creatives for it to be coming for artists, for it to be coming as designers, you know, logo creators, even web creators. Like it's so wild to see. Um, and obviously that's just a couple of fields. It's really disrupting, like also programming and things like that, which I also often, I also think of as a creative field. Point being that it's a time, it's a very amazing time. It's also a very scary time for a lot of people. Uh, I tend more towards optimistic side of things, which I'm sure we'll get into, but uh, I will just say that it has reignited my passion. So, and I think I'm closing in now on that Ikigai guy because I love it. Uh, I'm passionate about it. The world needs to like figure out how to level up from all aspects of life. And I really think that there's going to be a big budgets there. I mean, you know, smaller budgets working with smaller clients, but because you can do things a lot more efficiently, but also larger clients that really need to start figuring out how to get into the game uh, before they, before they get uh, left behind, you know? Yeah. As I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about like, sure, maybe some executives might be like, oh, we don't need a designer. We don't need like a team to manage us. We don't need it. Like we'll just like make it. We'll just build our app. And then it's like, yeah, but did you really design it thinking about like the user first? Did you really test it out? Did you really like get feedback and how, you know, you still need to tweak it and fine tune it. And like, you don't just take what the robot gives you and say like, here you go, robot right. made an app. Like you really have to like collaborate to like and iterate with it like I think that's a really important aspect and and yeah I'm also dealing with this Doug where I'm like oh my goodness is like the whole entire design field getting like disrupted right now and like where do I channel my creative energy and my critical thinking and like the the skills that the robots don't have right I mean sure right. they can recreate enough and they've taken in so much data that they can now like digest it and like appear creative right i mean what's happening is everyone's afraid of <laughs> ai taking their jobs and that's not the right way of looking at it it's going to be people who understand how to use ai that's going to take your jobs right you know and so it's the time for all of us as creatives and whatever field we're in to begin playing with it to see how we can uh, use it in our workflows how like we can use it to be both more efficient and more uh, productive and also more creative. And I think that that's the point that a lot of people are missing is that 
this is an amazing time to democratize creativity. So as designers, we can start to get even more in, inspiration from all different you know, uh, sources or I think for writing is a great example because I've written a book. Uh, I wrote a book. It was my first AI creative project back in April. And within 30 days, it went from a loose idea to published on Amazon. I even cloned my voice and the clone read my audio book. And it was actually a pretty great uh, experience. There was It's not quite ready for prime time. The technology did need me to kind of go back in and do some manual editing, but it was fascinating. And, and the way I reason I bring that up is because I've written a book without AI too. I've got my author name is Dougie Lux and I've written two books now, one by hand and one with a, uh, in collaboration with AI. And it was amazing to see. And in that case, and I think that this is a good example of how AI can help, AI really took the sort of dreaded blank page, curse of the blank page away. And it started to put stuff down. Right? It started to give a framework that I could then get creative with. So it was really a fascinating process going from the target audience and their problem to like your unique uh, solutions and your authority to teach that. And then how to put that into some sort of framework that gets the uh, message across. And in this case, I'm an expert digital nomad. Like I've been doing it for 20 years before it even had a term. Um, <laughs> yeah, I really pride myself on being able to land in a new spot and just be productive and healthy and um, yeah, and also having fun and balancing life and play and work. But um, the point was that AI helped create the scaffolding for the book. I was then able to actually provide personal stories, insights, uh, experiences of each section and each chapter such that um, I could then watch as the AI took its kind of like drier, a little bit more like the boring research side of it that I would have really not wanted to do, took that and then combined it with all my narrative like stories and my tone of voice uh, in the writing style. And I watched as it put those things together in such an amazing way and brought things to probably 90% of the way such that I could go back in, be like, oh, okay, there was a few things that weren't quite correct, a few things that maybe were missed, some things that were like, sometimes it would make up a story. Um, but that was kind of cool because it then showed that like, here's a place that I should input a story to, yeah. to, show the, to like kind of drive the point home. So I'll just make it like, I'll just keep it as a place where there's a story told. I'll just make it my own story. So um, yeah, as a creative person, it felt so collaborative. And I think that that's what people are, are missing is that AI is not gonna do all the things. It still very much needs a person to help guide it. And the yeah. more creative we can be uh, with the way we think and the way we can describe what we want, the more rich the outcome will be. Mm. Yeah, it's like it needs so much thoughtfulness to make it even really valuable or useful. Otherwise, it's like, um, yeah, it, it, it's like what I'm hearing is there's just so much of this collaboration where you didn't have to stare at a blank page. You got to like get ideas and then see like, oh, no, that's wrong. This is missing. Let me change this. Oh, I could add a story. Let me replace the story. But like right. making it more like that. And um, I think what makes me a little nervous at times is when I see like these people trying to sell, make your course with AI and just give us eight words. And then like, <laughs> we've got a course and I'm just like, no, <laughs> like, how is this? Like, are they just like skipping that there's collaboration involved or they like, I don't know. But like, when I see things like that, I get really nervous and I'm like, the web is going to get really messy with a lot of content and mm -hmm. it already is pretty yeah. noisy. And then, yeah, it's like, make it go viral can be a prompt, but like, at what cost? Right. Well, I mean, this brings it back to a really wonderful point, which I know that you probably can get behind. And that is like, what is at the root of what we're creating? Like, what is, you know, what kind of soul, what kind of heart? Um, are we bringing into our creations, whatever that is, uh, it doesn't have to be AI related, but anything that we're doing, what's our intentions behind it? Was that noise canceling or did you mute your zoom for that sneeze? <laughs> I was like, wow, those AirPods are incredible at cutting out the background noise and sneezes. Anyways, um, 
you know, uh, God bless you. It's just a really good time to consider those things. And I really hope that more people in Silicon Valley, more people than I imagine, I really hope that more people than I think are thinking about and feeling about like, what is my feeling behind what I'm creating here? And, you know, if you think about it, um, AI itself is almost like this young child that we're raising. I mean, think <laughs> about the images and the abilities of it a year ago and now what it can create, right? Literally, it's, and it's growing fast. Are we creating it in a loving way? Are we guiding it well uh, with our heart and with, you know, what we know to be mm. good human traits? Or are we just letting it run rampant? Like now, as it gets into its terrible twos <laughs> of chat GPT, that's something to think about as we put content, content out into the world is like, is this really a value? Um, is this actually just clickbait? Is this, am I trying to pull a quick one and trying to make yeah. sales real quick to, you know, because you can, you can, you can nowadays use like psychology and use ads to really effectively create things that people click on and they sell them and they get the product and they're like, oh, this wasn't what I was promised. And everything that I do, I'm really trying to make sure that, um, it both has my heart in it, that I can really believe in it, and that it really produces value for people. That was really insightful to hear about, like, first of all, like what the world needs, which is one of the aspects of Ikigai, which is like, we need to train this baby, right? And like, take, like, show it how to move. And also as businesses, you don't just develop technology, like, you don't just say, hey, AI, go build it. It's like, it actually needs us to drive it and we have to do it in a really thoughtful way. Right. So I like to hear sometimes, like, I know, so you went to one of the best schools in the world um, for design and like, what was something that you learned through design school that you didn't know going in that really changed your perspective to this day? Oh my gosh. Well, you probably don't know, uh, I don't even know if I've told you this before, but I grew up in England from a very formative age, age eight to age 18. My mom's Italian and she moved us over to Europe. I don't know. Did I ever, did I ever tell you that? I feel like I've heard some of the story. It sounds okay. familiar. Yeah. Okay. So it was so funny because I went over there. I had, I was born in DC, Washington, DC. I was there until I was seven. And then my mom moved us over to Europe. And so I was like the American boy at school. Well, then I started, you know, I, I started to actually get an English accent. So to the Amer my old American friends, I sounded English. To the British, I still sounded American. I became like this real like man of nowhere. And that's no doubt what influenced my digital nomad pursuits. But I will say that it went, it, I went to the school where Winston Churchill went. So um, there's a couple oh. of schools in England. Uh, one's called Eton, one's called Harrow. And they're always sort of battling it out for like, who's the most old school British education, you know? <laughs> But uh, I went to Harrow and that's where Winston Churchill went. So you can imagine it was like the buildings were older than our country, you know, <laughs> they're like the older than the U.S. These places where I would study Latin, like, you know, talk about, uh, you know, um, Harry Potter with the teachers with the mortar board hats and the capes and the canes that had just been outlawed a few years before corporal punishment had just been outlawed, but they still had canes in the classroom just as a reminder, you know, of what of the times we'd come from. So it's very strict and very in many ways, uh, individuality crushing. It was meant to prepare mm. us to be cogs of the empire, to be, you know, cogs of industry, you know, titans. And um, mm. many of my friends went into, into, you know, fields and areas like that. They, you know, became big positions, whether it was in finances uh, or, you know, um, large company positions. Uh, and I never quite fit in to that whole category. I was always the anomaly there. I was always getting in trouble. I probably hang, hung with the bad kids. Uh, you know, I was the artsy one. I loved, they had a great design program there. And the way English education works, this isn't good for everybody, but it, it can be quite great if you know where your passions lie, because we were able to specialize at an age of 16. And by the time I was 16 or 17, I was only doing three classes, math, design, and art. And that's always been my passion, the intersection of those things. And um, so afterwards, I had an American art teacher and she's like, you should really check out Rhode Island School of Design um, for college because I wanted to go back to the US. And so I'd applied to a few different, I applied to MIT. I applied to uh, my, at my mom's request. I'm like, mom, I'm not an engineer, <laughs> but I applied and I definitely did not get into MIT and then a few others. And then RISD, 
RISD was my one that this art teacher had recommended. And it was really, I went to see it and I was like, this is amazing. And so I went from one of the most strict styles of education. I managed to hang on. I never got expelled. I think on the last day I was asked to leave before the last night because they knew that me and some friends were planning some mischief, which I'm sure we were. We were. So I was sent I was sent away for the last night so I couldn't cause any trouble. But I made it through the school and um, it was such a, uh, it was quite soul crushing in some ways. So by the time I got to college in the US, I went to Rhode Island School Design, which you cannot imagine, I'm sure you can, but to many people, the way I would describe it is like, imagine all the crazy art kids from around the country, the weirdos, the quirky ones, the super talented, but like, you know, anomalies from their own schools descend on this one school and we're like 800 people. I don't even, the whole school, I forget how big it is. Maybe the whole school is only like a thousand or something like that. But you know, a few hundred people in, in our, um, uh, in the freshman year of like the most creative kooky characters. And here's me coming from this strict education and RISD completely spun me in the most beautiful way into like, here's the most, we want you to be as creative and expressive as you can be in all forms of life. And so, I'll say that what I gleaned from that, I went, uh, first of all, they do foundation year. I was expecting to get right into my industrial design or like that kind of a course. But the first year is all about foundation studies. You study everything from the ground up again, from drawing to sculpture, art history, you know, all the greats and really start to understand the foundation of art and creativity on almost like a psychological level and as well as like historical level, foundational level. So that then once you graduate to your, um, uh, second year, you can start to focus. And that's when I got into industrial design. So product design, physical product design. And uh, what it really gave me, what I left with, uh, and I rare, I didn't do much in the form of um, physical product design. In my last year, serendipitously, it was right around the you know turn of the millennium. And uh, the web was just starting to take off. And I did a class. If anyone remembers, there was a there was an animation sort of program called Flash, uh, Macromedia Flash back in the day. And I learned how to use it and I learned how to put it on websites. And I was like, oh my God, like my laptop is suddenly my factory. And pretty much it has been ever since. Like when I realized that that was my, you know, I could create with that and I could work remotely with that. I started to build websites for my friends. I'm like, hey, artists, you're all amazing. Y'all need websites. I'll do you one for a real dirt cheap price. <laughs> so that was it. And literally to this day, artists, I've, I've still got one of my clients. I've made like over the 20 years, four of his websites as new technologies and things have come out. Point being that, um, you know, I think RISD gave me, um, even though I didn't do much in product design, what it gave me was the design process as a way of thinking. And I think that at its best, this is what college, you know, level education can really give us, you know, or education from other sources too. But a way of thinking. So now that's what I think I have applied to everything in my life and not just work. My life itself, I think of as a design project. Mm. And this is where I'm, I'm, you know, I'm the 44th iteration, you know, 44th year iteration now. Um, and that's okay if certain features aren't fully um, formed because this is just an iteration and I'm mm. getting user feedback and I'm getting, you know, uh, thinking about new features or whatnot and that I can integrate into you know, version 45 coming up next year, right? Yeah. So if you can think about anything in life from your uh, client projects to your personal pursuits as a design project, not only does it give you a framework to begin to design and build and deliver, it also takes some of the pressure off having to be perfect. Because as you know, design is not perfect and neither are we, you know? So what I have to say about that. Thank you, Dougie. So my question to you here is like, for someone who doesn't really quite know the design process, and if you could summarize, like, what were some of the things that like shaped your how you think, shaping your design process, and like really helping you to, um, both design your life and products and everything, like thinking yeah. iteratively. So, what would you what would you say were like some of those nuggets of wisdom, sure. and how can people also learn more? Yeah, I mean, in a way, it's not unlike the scientific process in some ways. And that's why it's so funny where people often think like areas like science and creativity or design or art are so separate. I often don't think they are. You know, a lot of it comes up, starts with sort of a hypothesis. 
you know, um, and as artists, as designers, we can have a hypothesis of like, especially as, uh, and I think there is a aspect of good design that requires empathy in the designer, right? And so anyone can think of <clears throat> their own problem uh, and something that they want to solve. Not everybody does. Uh, maybe a lot of people just complain about it, uh, you know, but uh, ultimately, if you're entrepreneurial, for example, a lot of people start with a problem that they're having, or if you're designing something for a client, you can say like, hey, I've used this, or for a course student, you can say, hey, I had this problem and here's how I solved it. Or you can use your empathy to really get into um, someone's shoes. And I know as like a UX researcher, you understand what this is like. It's really understanding someone who might radically be different from you. Like some of our courses back at RISD were thinking about astronauts that might not be visiting home for um, years and like how to design for them and what kinds of needs that they're going to have. Or um, old people that have limited dexterity in their hands. Um, or you know, kids that are entering a really scary hospital environment, right? And so first comes down to empathy in a lot of ways. It's really getting in touch with your potential user, thinking about what they might be struggling with, talking with them about their actual problems, their actual feelings. So rather than you coming in and being like, here, I got a solution for you, but actually coming from your perspective, really listening to your target audience for what they, mm. um, and it's, it's not always the most fun part. Some people think it's the most fun part. Um, but it's important, it's critical, you know, like you don't want to jump into creating something for somebody who doesn't even want the thing, right? So the first part a lot is that empathy, at which point you can then create a hypothesis. You can start to brainstorm like, hey, I think that this is an area that needs a solution for this person. Let's start to just brainstorm things. And at that point, the beautiful thing at that point is nothing's wrong. And this is sometimes where I've noticed that I can differ from my scientific friends and talking with them, I'd have to almost um, give them a little bit of conversational priming and be like, hey guys, don't worry, we're in design mode right now. Nothing's wrong, we're brainstorming blue sky because you know they're often so worried that like, oh, yeah. I have to base everything in reality. I mean, they have a lot riding on their uh, reputation. They don't wanna opt, but I'm like, hey, okay, guys, we're just in blue sky mode now. I've worked with a lot of scientists uh, and people on uh, helping them develop their, um, websites and personal brands and, and stage time talks and things like that. That's why I'm bringing them up. But uh, point being that then there is that aspect of the blue sky mode where nothing's wrong. You can just put down ideas and get as crazy as you think. Because even though one idea might be crazy, it might inform an aspect of your final or semi-final solution. Because then at that point, you begin to narrow down, begin to start to put some meat on the bones of an actual idea. And that's beginning to get to a kind of next stage where you can start to talk with the user, potential target audience, see where like what's starting to sound, are you hitting the nail on the head as you lead towards a first version prototype and whatever that is, you know, whether that's a, a app, whether that's a hammer, you know, have that. And as you know, you then start to get feedback on that. And it goes, it goes from literally low resolution where your paint pencil on a napkin kind of sketch kind of vibe to more high resolution. And then it goes through this iteration process of like, okay, let's nail like this versions, get it to its like, you know, final stage of this iteration. And then you have it. And then you start to play with it. You start to see how it's working. You get user feedback. And that also shows, just like I was saying earlier, it's not a final product. Nothing's ever final unless you just say like, okay, well, we're not doing any more work on it. That's the last iteration. Then it was its final stage. But for a, for example, for a software, for um, most things out there, sometimes there's, you know, they're actually fine, but like the kind of company has ideas about how they can release this year's version really just to make profit. Or they design, you know, limited uh, usage into it so it breaks and you got to buy it again. And sometimes it's like the newer versions of things aren't even as good as the older version of things, mm. especially when it comes to like, you know, tools. Sometimes some tools are like certain things. It's kind of a marketed obsolescence or planned obsolescence, I guess, sometimes. But my point being, for, it comes back to heart and soul. If you're designing something well for longevity and to really be useful, then um, that's what you're delivering. And then you can iterate on it. Um, for the next um, version. So that I think sort of summarizes the general arc of the design process. 
uh, and a process that you can apply to design, but you can also apply to problems um, in your life too, which I like to think about. I love that so much, Dougie, because for many reasons, I also think of it as very, I, I, I think about like Leonardo da Vinci and how he was like everything. He was an engineer, he was an artist, he was a designer. He was just like making on all aspects of creativity. He was just like, what can I build? What can I make? Um, you know, how do I just like engage in the world and like think about what's possible and imagine? It's like, let me test it. Let me, you know, take an idea from a concept and like try it out. And like now it's just getting really easy. You can even test a pretty high resolution prototype now given right. all the tools that are available like you you don't even and with much less time than ever before you can like and then you could scrap the whole thing and be like this is useless um yeah. though it a first version might just be a conversation with somebody and like how much would you be willing to pay for whatever it is and like really getting like is there any sense that they would actually pay for it you know what i'm saying right. that's a way to test an idea as well before right you were going to say something no, I think you're right on. I think that that is where we're at right now. I mean, honestly, like I've been working on a really fascinating new project. So I've been, um, I do a lot of AI automations for clients. So simple, it can be simple stuff. It's like, hey, this form needs to be run through an AI. It needs to then produce a PDF or assign somebody a task or, or add someone to a, you know, sort of SMS messaging platform or all those things. And there's these branches, right? And the other thing that I'm working on is kind of custom assistance, also known as chatbots, um, that can help mm -hmm. clients with tasks, whether it's internal or external. Um, so for example, you can have, uh, I've been working on the framework to create, I'm calling it a brand bot. I think you're going to love this idea. Um, and I've developed it. I mean, maybe may even talked about it when I saw you last, but I've developed it a lot in these last few weeks. And the idea is basically Thanks. like that. Imagine having this assistant that completely understands your brand from your target audience and their problem, uh, your authority to deliver a solution, what that solution is, all of your offerings that assist in helping your target audience overcome their challenges, uh, but also more deeply even understands your brand in terms of tone of voice, maybe your brand colors, uh, how you engage with the world, your content marketing strategy, uh, you know, and all that sort of thing, content creation. The point is chatbots are great. You can do a lot of this in chat GPT. You can go on there and say, hey, write me a, to your point earlier, write me a LinkedIn post about, you know, elephant mating habits. Um, now that's going to produce something and it's going to produce something relatively interesting. It's amazing, you know, but if you can actually really enrich that question with like who it's for and what you want them to get out of it and some of the aspects of the mating habits as they relate maybe to human psychology, whatever it is, you like, um, you know, uh, you could really see how a longer prompt is going to produce a lot richer of a response, right? So in, similarly with a brand bot that knows you and your brand so well, it can produce really amazing content. Um, and the reason that I bring that up is it can also even look at your brand and say like, hey, compared to what your offerings are and what your skills are, um, you've got some gaps. There's some other things that you could offer to your target audience Here's a bunch of ideas. And I did this yesterday showing a client who was so impressed with it. He just bought a brand buy. He now has hired me to do one for his company uh, because I sh it showed a gap in his offerings. From yeah. there, I said, um, okay, great. Let's flesh out what that offering is. Boom, we fleshed it out into a first draft. He's like, wow, this is amazing. He's like, I'd want to make some tweaks, but this is really close. I'm like, yeah, right on. This is like a first version. It's like, okay, but let's just say that this is great. Now let's make that into a sales page. Great. Um, and then the, it made a sales page for it. And now like, okay, awesome. Uh, we could put that then into whatever platform their website is. And, uh, we could create a little form that says, get in touch about this service. And then if they do, then they can, I say like, Hey, follow up with four emails that will be released every week after they've signed up with some information that's really helpful regardless, but then also leads them back to the, um, registration. If it's a course, say whatever. And so before you knew it, it blew his mind and it was like, you know, we did it over there for 10 minutes or something like that, um, let alone all the other things you could do with it, like create LinkedIn posts or whatever to market this thing, add ideas, SEO content. That to... is amazing. He gave you his interest to start with, like, this yeah. is what I'm good at. This is what I can do. And yep. this is what I'm offering. And then it found 
your yeah. brand bot was like, wait, you're missing an offering opportunity. Here. Right. Right. Exactly. And you can really train these brand bots. So they basically just sit there mm -hmm. like a, a, a GPT, chat GPT, fresh chat, but it's already ready to go with all your info. Right. So mm -hmm. you can even um, do things like I blew his mind. I think this other thing was it's sold in two. You can say um, you could say, OK, brand bot, I recently found a competitor's website. Uh, give me a SWOT analysis, which is like the strengths, the weaknesses, all that sort of stuff. Um, Opportunities and threats. Exactly. So do a SWOT analysis between my brand and this competitor. And so what, and you just literally give it the link of the website. And because ChatGPT's current integration with Bing, which is Microsoft's uh, you know, influence over it, it can go search my competitor, look at, my, know my entire brand and all my offerings and do an analysis of them. Okay, so point being like within 15 minutes, I've done research and analysis for his uh, company. I've done a whole new um, opportunity exploration complete with the landing page content and the follow-up drip campaigns. Blew his mind. He's like, I want one of these things. It's amazing. And I'm like, okay, great. Close the window. You know, didn't you like that? And that's the point here. Like we just came up with weeks worth of content. Is it as like perfect as a whole research and analysis team? No, or as a design team or copywriting team? No, but in terms of like a first version, Mm. brainstorm something amazing we delivered so much value that then you know I even right there came up with a logo for the, the uh, a fictional company you can do it right there in the paid version of chat gpt now without even leaving this window you can say hey here's my new company idea i used angel cakes as an example so it was like heavenly baked goods i came up with that uh, just you know but i thought it'd be fun to use and it was like create a little muffin with angel halo and um wings you know so, um, oh. but then we close the window <gasps> and all of that stuff's gone. And there's this aspect to creativity right now that's kind of crazy. Like you would never do all that work just for funsies, but now we can, we can create imagery, we can create ideas and see what inspires us to then bring our amazing human skills into the mm. mix and really make sure that that's a valuable offering, really refine the pieces that are a little bit more mm. standard. Same with my book, going back to that. It was like, it gave me the scaffolding, but I breathed life into it with my unique human perspective. I think that's where we're at now. So good to hear this and so refreshing. Dougie Fresh, tell me where <laughs> Fresh came from. Oh my gosh. You know, it's funny. Uh, I feel there's this great power in names. Um, you know, once we give things, once we speak things into reality, um, you know, our thoughts, you know, turn into our words and our deeds, you know, and our actions. And so um, names are words, right? So I've always felt, I've always felt that. And even my author name, which is Dougie Lux, I found out that Douglas is Gaelic for dark water. Uh, mm. So I was like, wow, I've been going through my whole life, you know, without knowing what that name even meant, my Celtic origins, the dark water, sort of you know, profound depth, that kind of concept. I'm like, wow, that's true, but it's also kind of heavy. It's a heavy cross to bear. And so my author name is Dougie Lux. And so Lux, thanks to my English education, is Latin for light. So the name Dougie Lux is an aspirational name of dark water light, mm. which is a transmutation, an acknowledgement of the shadow, but a transmutation of it into uh, light, you know? So and so, um, yeah, and so names are important. So bringing it back to your question, where did Fresh Dougie Fresh come from? Well, I didn't know it at the time, but my buddy at college started calling me Dougie Fresh. And I was very like, I come from the English uh, kind of world of uh, music. And I wasn't as familiar with the hip hop legacy of like the 80s and 90s and Dougie Fresh, which was the human beatbox machine. And he was a classic uh, member of the early hip hop community. Um, and so Dougie Fresh, and I love the nickname and it just stuck. And then I actually ended up getting into a lot of hip hop stuff and emceeing, uh, you know, as a, on an MC and DJ group. And it was really like a fun college thing to do. And uh, so the name stuck. And so eventually um, people started just calling me Dougie or Dougie Fresh or Fresh. And so it really stuck as a, stuck as a brand. And that's why my brand name is Project Fresh dot com like i literally after college i graduated in 2002 i made my own website with my new website skills and project mm -hmm. Fresh was born so i've had that website for now more than 20 years and it's evolved with me as my design of my own life has evolved you know mm -hmm. and um 
And so it's funny because recently, I think like a few years ago, like someone, someone messaged me from those years because D- Dougie Fresh stuck, I stuck as a name for some time until finally I was like, you know, Dougie Fresh is, this is like, he is somebody else. I think what actually was this guy saying like, hey, we're, I saw that you were on stage last night in Chicago with someone called Slick Rick. Like what? And he obviously didn't know who Dougie Fresh was. <laughs> but Dougie Fresh was this 80s rapper. And I think at that point, it was a few years after college. At that point, I was like, you know, it might be t- time to refresh. Like, oh, shoot. Fire. I didn't know. I didn't know you like, wait. So like, you know how the celebrities change names every few years? Right. Like Sometimes with their persona. Sure. Well, this is an interesting question because I actually have a few questions on this topic that I want to get to yeah. on different topics about you creatively transforming throughout your life. Um, but I feel like, Actually, it's kind of tied to this, and it's something I'm personally struggling with. Like, I think about personal, like, I kind of have this slight aversion to the personal branding Mm. thing. Like, what's my brand? Maybe we talked about this a little bit and like fitting myself into a brand box, you know? But then it's almost like, because like who you are is so like perfect on some Mm. level, like, you're soul identity is just like you know existence consciousness and bliss it is pure it is eternal it doesn't die when the body dies like nothing it just like goes on forever and it is also unique and individual to you right so it's like that's such a beautiful idea so sometimes like branding things kind of like get in the way right it's hard to brand that that level of purity (laughs) Yeah, it's like, yeah, so it's just like, I I mean, you know, we talked about this a little bit. Um, And I guess we're kind of getting into that, like the rebrand. I don't want to get lost in that, but maybe we can just pin it for a second. And I want to go back to this question of like, when you were a kid and you were like in the flow, like, what was that like? Speak about one of those memories that you feel inspired to share. Yeah, and I will just touch really quickly on brand. We can get back into it um, later, but I have always thought of myself as a brand in my life. Um, and only recent, and I always used to think of that as one thing. I had to be one thing, but only recently, these last few years, I've really realized that actually I can be multifaceted. I can have my author persona. I can have my professional persona. I can have my f- persona for my friends. Like these are all sort of brands. They're like, there's a master brand, which might get to the level of spirituality and connectedness to something greater that you're talking about. But then maybe these yeah. like, sub brands like you know there's like the unilever but then there's like you know the the brands underneath them so you maybe there's a way to think about it like that Um, but and also have fun with it like you know like for example dougie lux is this mischievous alter ego uh writer that does things that douglas campbell the professional who deals with you know companies would never do would never admit to doing right and so it's so funny i realized that's possible when my mom who i wrote this book that was a little bit racy and edgy about some stuff called the motorcycle and the molecule when she read it it was a big coming out to a lot of like some of my you know edgier sides of my um existence and she read it and she was like oh my god this isn't professional i was like Oh, mom, don't worry. That's just, that's Dougie Lux. That's what Dougie Lux would do. I would never do that. And it was so funny. It actually helped her segment me into who she wants to talk to her friends about and who she acknowledges as part of me, but she can kind of like have some sort of container for. So, and I think that that's really useful for even dealing with, you know, your other, that can be useful for dealing with your other relationships and trying on those different characters. Um, You know, so that was that, but that's my thoughts on the branding stuff. Moving Thank to- you. And I think there's an element of integration too. Like there's yeah. that integration of like how to integrate instead of like, oh, you don't like that side of me? We'll pretend it doesn't exist. Like how right. do you like, how right. do you also embrace it? And how does everyone really embrace their different sides, including oh, I love the that. thoughts you don't like, including like, you know, because, you know, sometimes it is the mud that gets you to the flowers, but like yeah. you have to go through the mud right and then the flowers emerge but like it's like you really have to become a seedling and then like it's it's tough but it's it's what you need sometimes right and And i think the authenticity is where it's at like wherever you're whatever you're sharing whether it's the joy or the sorrow the light or the shadow is like people feel your authenticity you know and like being able to have like the areas to play with like is sort of fun it's just kind of like because we're all somewhat schizophrenic with our identities. We have like ourselves in reality. We have our kind of like 
online brands. Some of us have a few different online things. Then we have like who, how we are around our family, how we are around our friends, all these sorts of things. And they're all parts of us, like you say. Um, and uh, the integration is, is a beautiful thing. Like when I realized that actually I can have these multiple personalities and that's okay uh, and play mm. with them, that feels really freeing, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think that's- And I good... love- Yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh -uh. you? <laughs> no, I was going to segue to your other question. I realized I just went on a tangent there, but- um, I can Oh, talk. no. I, I was, uh, you keep inspiring something else and I'll let you go there now in a second. I just want to say, like you were mentioning, you know, a thought becomes a word, a word becomes a deed. And like, it's like, ultimately, this all bec creates a character. And um, I think that's yeah. a very lovely thing to think about. So mm. back to Dougie as a kid. And yeah. He's like in the kindergarten class and he's like deeply focused. And what's he doing? Oh, my gosh. I'm so glad that you're talking about this because literally I was listening to a podcast yesterday. I just want to make sure that it was the one that I was thinking of uh, who it was hosting it. It was Andrew Huberman, uh, the Huberman Lab podcast. Uh, and he was interviewing um, uh, Robert Greene, who's wrote, you know, 49 Laws of Power or Success, yeah. like different books, right? Mm -hmm. um, and he asked that exact question. He's like, it was about finding, you know, your pursuit or your passion in life and living that passion. And a lot of it was getting back to that pre child pre-puberty before mm. external frameworks uh, started having such a powerful effect on us, you know, before we mm -hmm. were lost a little bit of our shine, you know, like what were the things that naturally our soul uh, resonated with? What were the mm. things that lit us up? Can we get mm. back to that place? And I'm just like, I was remembering it, trying to remember. And um, my mom said, like, first of all, I was just always a very happy baby, you know, like at first the the nurse thought, you know, when I came out that I was like laughing and that I had passed gas. But my mom was like, no, I've had kids before. I've had, this is my third baby. This is a happy one, you know? <laughs> so first of all, like <laughs> sharing delight uh, and eliciting delight from people has always been something that I have enjoyed. Connecting people, uh, actually, I've always wanted, my family's just so all over the place. All I've ever wanted is like a sort of uh, bringing everybody together. I've had limited success with my family, but I've done it a lot with my friends and like creating community, creating events, uh, things like that, and gone through lots of transitions in that place too, you know, realizing now that um, as an older person, I can't be friends with everybody, you know, like I gotta really pick wisely. Um, and, you know, so there are some uh, sometimes shadows to our natural gifts. Like I was so good at uh, attracting so many people that I ended up getting too spread thin. Mm. Uh, those events so there's always like a bit of a shallow shadow side to our exploration or to our natural inclinations because the other thing i love to do is um explore new tools i remember when i would get like i love recording my voice i've always been a documenter that's why i love writing and it's never made me much money but it's sort of something i do as my hobby i love to document with photography with writing with note taking journaling all that kind of stuff um, but my mom got me a dictaphone and i loved it it was like my voice recorder and mm -hmm. um, I would just have so much fun coming up with stories and activities uh, on the voice recorder, inter interviewing my parents or friends, you know, things like that. Um, but I would look at the manual for that voice recorder. And this comes to like a whole nother skill. I would look at the manual for that and I would read it. I would love reading the manuals for the VCR. I love reading like how to like master every tool and toy like I would look at the thing and read it all and then play with it, you know, like, and then no, I would know all the tools. And so that's really a lot of those mm. things combined to where I'm at now. And what I create is like, I learn the latest tools. I learn mm. how they're valuable and I share them. And so where that can be a shadow is you just get too deep into the tools and you forget what the reason you're even doing it is. And like, why am I exploring mm. these? And AI is a huge problem right now for that because there's a million tools to explore. So for someone like yeah. me, like gotta be real mindful about like okay there's a million tools great which one's totally applicable to what i need to do right now what i need to master to be to handle some of my own things but also to be really valuable for my clients and so kind of bringing that into focus um is really a beautiful thing because then if you i just love learning things having it be a very valuable thing that then i can either help with a client with or teach you know i love a big part of my 
offerings right now are courses and course creation and teaching people how to use some of these technologies that are emerging so that they can prepare for what's coming, you know? Mm. Wow. Okay. I got, I really like what you shared about that kind of one-to-one relationship between, you know, baby Doug, who's like taking apart all, like reading the whole manual, figuring out how the VCR works, teaching the whole family. (laughs) And now it's like kind of the same. You're like, how do I learn how what's happening? And then like offer it to other people, like the connecting people and totally. And the and connecting sharing people, this delight. Yeah. That's where a lot of the soul of it comes in. I always get back to this thing of like, how can what I do help us improve relationships with ourselves, with others, and with the planet? You know, and that if I can be doing that work while playing with cool tech and while like, you know, yeah. doing most of this stuff, or whatever, that it comes back to like having a a solid anchor yeah and you kind of said it like this like you did this kind of like how do (laughs) I you actually did this like how do I not get like so caught up in all the different tools but really bring it back (laughs) tell me more about sharing delight Mm. as baby Dougie what was he thinking you know uh I didn't expect that question and I guess what it comes down to is there was a lot of upset in my house like there was really a lot Uh, my mom was very stressed about a lot of things. Um, there was often money problems, not in the, it was interesting, you know, I didn't come from a poor childhood at all. Um, oh, here's my microphone, I better put that on. Um, but there was still money problems and it wasn't about having too little, it was about when it was around, it just like, it caused relationship issues and there was a lot of upset in the house. And I re- seem to remember a lot of stress by the point I was born, my parents already, I think were, you know, kind of, you know, wanting to not be together, but having me come about like that kept them together for longer. So there was just some upsets in the house. And I think I just wanted everyone to be happy. I just wanted people to be together and happy. And that was always like, you know what I would do. So I often became kind of the clown at school too. I became the clown. Um, and in my life, I have been accused of being too positive. Like, and I think that some really powerful lessons in my 30s started to show me and experiences uh, with plant medicine and other psychedelics um, started to show me that there was a bit of a uh, facade on that was only wanting light. You know, I had didn't at that point I didn't even know that dark water was my was my name. I was going through life with dark water, trying to live only in the light, completely not integrated, until finally I realized like, wow, there's actually some things to not smile about in our reality, and some things that can't just be uh, glazed over because they don't feel good. Um, and so, mm, so light, wise. In fact, delight. Very light, wise. Another way to say uh, say my name is Dougie Lux. Delight. I like that. <laughs> But point that, yeah, point being that, um, yeah, I think that that's important to like, it's almost That'll more like one of your new names. That was one of my new names. Maybe that'd be my DJ name when I finally start making some music. <laughs> you light in the house, you know, but um, I don't know. So <laughs> having substance behind your contentedness, behind your delight, feeling that deep. So you're not just like flitting about happy. And I do think there's a lot of that going on in the world right now where people are like trying to fill their lives with just things that are funny or happy or good all the time and like not paying attention to some of the things that maybe do need attention in their own lives or in the world, in their relationships. Um, and so celebrating, of course, all the good things while also, you know, acknowledging what needs to be fixed and finding a good balance there is I think the um and maybe this is just the old age talking now I'm in my mid 40s yeah. when we start this to so have wise these- <laughs> this is so wise oh my god and what are you I mean even you know that Pixar movie Inside Out uh-huh I love that movie but I don't Me know too. if you remember there was the character Joy and like you see the memory of the little girl because she's got like you see the little girl's head she's got like fear anger joy like all these emotions and you see them talking to each other Mm. and that behind the most joyful experiences of her life and like the deepest memories or core memories was pain like there was usually pain that then led Mm -hmm. to some connection or some like there was something difficult like the parents were upset she ran away from home but then they came together and like that was like a 
that created a, a bond, right? Mm-hmm. Or like they lost the game, but then, you know, the, all the friends came together and that created this like core bonding moment. And so, yeah, I, it's actually so wise and it's essential. Mm. It's essential that mm-hmm. like we embrace those struggles and, yeah it is it's another metaphor it's just like the like the dirt you know is needed and necessary for right. like the flowers to bloom and it's like how do i look at everything in my life is like this is happening for me instead of it's happening to me because maybe yeah. i'm being pushed to like pivot or mm. or like go or maybe it's not even pivot maybe it's just to go through this difficulty yeah. and like discover something richer in me that wasn't mm. there until I had to unravel the sprout little wow. seedling go girl <laughs> you know? Reach on. I'm so behind you I mean I think to your point like one yeah from some of our greatest struggles come our greatest gifts um and how that also translates to just day-to-day life is something interesting I heard, and I forget who said it recently, but uh, I often was used to hearing like, everything happens for a reason, you know? Uh, And what this person who was being interviewed, I forget who it was, um, but they're very wise. And uh, and they said, well, you know, I like to think about it, not like everything happens for a reason, because that kind of takes the power away from you. It's like thing the world's happening to you in some way. Um, and I like the idea of thinking it's happening for us, like the everything's conspiring in our favor. They call it, what do they call it? Pronoia, yeah. like, you know, yeah. positive, kind of paranoid, positive. Rob Presney's yeah. um, philosophy and book on right. the content of like the whole universe is conspiring to shower you with blessings. I love that. And, you know, I, I think too. this guy's point was maybe we, it's even, helps smooth that process when we think that it's not that everything happens for a reason it's that we make the reason of why things happen and that puts power back into our hands such that what story is it that you want to tell is it we've all been through hard times is is this the story that you want is this the thing that broke you is this the thing that everything from this point on uh led to the sadness of where you're going to be or where you're at now because guess what that's going to be a story that unfolds and it's going to prove itself to you and show you that that is, that is what was meant to be all along, you know, or are you going to acknowledge that, damn, that super sucked. That was not the plan uh, that I thought was going to happen. That's not how I planned it. As humans, we love to plan. There's a quote, like, you know, you humans have planned and God laughs or whatever. Yeah, um, God, you know, so. human proposes and God disposes. <laughs> exactly. So we've all been there. And so getting back to young Dougie, you don't want to just be like, oh, everything's fine. Everything's fine to the point where like you're maybe missing. But sometimes things are happening and they happen repeatedly because they're trying to show you something. And so it is important that, you know, I'm going through a few things like right now in my life where even at this point, I'm like, huh, I've experienced this before in a relationship or uh, in a situation like, huh, I'm the common thread here. What have I been doing to continue to create this thing, you know? And so I think that that is where we can acknowledge it and be like, ooh, didn't go according to plan. Oh, might be a big piece here I'm responsible for. And guess what? Thank you so much, Cosmos uh, person, uh, boss, lover, you know, whatever it is for helping reflect that, point that out, parent, you know, family member. Holidays is half often. Happening. <laughs> oh, thank you so much for pointing out, helping me realize that that thing is still unresolved in me, or that's still something that's there to work on, you know. But turning it into as much as possible, turning uh, the unfortunate or the unexpected into starting to look about like why did that happen, you know, and then creating, and that will inevitably be the story, the new story. It's rooted in like, damn, that sucked. Just like, you know, on a small example, like me losing that year worth of sponsorship with UCLA for the events Mm. happened, I wouldn't be where I am now. And I'm super, I think I'm closer to my Ikigai than ever. Possibly that Mm -hmm. path brought me towards my Ikigai in a different way. But who knows? What I do know is pivoting, like you were, the word you use, pivoting and adapting and staying like um, creative with situations just like nature when a tree falls on another tree the tree that the the young tree that the old tree fell on 
doesn't get emotional about it. Instead, it's like, like improv. It's like, hey, how can we create a whole new little micro yeah. ecosystem over under here? <laughs> you know, it's like, and that I think is, you know, nature is masterful at showing us uh, ability to adapt to our environment mm. uh, and not bitch about what you had, what plan you had, you know. <laughs> so appreciate you, Dougie. I really love that you shared everything there. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you, because you mentioned it a few times and <clears throat> You know, digital nomad you brought up a few times, but like, how are you defining digital nomad besides just someone who's traveling around with their um, computer? I feel like there's something there and yeah. I'm not exactly, it's like, it's something you're good at. And mm. I'm like, what is it? What is that thing? It's like, uh, here's my computer. It's at my laptop is my factory. Is right. that it? Like, or does it have some other meaning? Well, that's a deep question. You know, for a simple term, that's a deep question because like, Let's talk about it for a moment. What's the difference between a remote worker and a digital nomad, right? Both can work from home. Well, a remote worker usually sticks around their town that they're used to. Um, and a digital nomad realizes that, hey, I can actually now, and a bunch of people are being called back to work, but actually more people than ever are working from home. Mm -hmm. And they have, they have the ability, if they'd like, to go travel and uh, work remotely. And as long as they get their work done, shouldn't be a problem. There's a lot of different types of nomads from like, you know, the jet set nomad who can like be in a different place every week to the slow mad that maybe spends months or even like longer, you know, in different places. Personally, like I'm a mix somewhere in between there. I like to be in a place around a month sometimes if I really like it longer, but not usually less than that, just because of my own routine and getting kind of life set up for and even just like learning about the place. So like a month or so, but it's not for everybody. Right. And so for example, for me, just because my mom, I think, moved us around so much when I was little, because she also lived in Italy. So I was between Italy, the US, England, um, a lot of places in Europe that we kind of would, would go to. And so gave me that gift of being able to get to a new place, like feel comfortable in it, be like, wow, this is different and, and interesting, you know, like and roll with it, make new friends. Uh, and so that's the light side of it. That's really exciting what the a digital nomad is. There's shadow side to it too, just like with everything. It's like, are you actually running from something, you know, mm. uh, literally uh, from something or somebody that you haven't resolved something with or something in yourself that you haven't resolved, uh, you know, and that's where it's like very interesting to consider is like, what am I doing now in my life? Well, even if it's not digital nomading, is it like, and is it <clears throat> a healthy response or is there something that like, you know, like even things that seem healthy can can be unhealthy when done excessively. You know, like if you're constantly jumping around, claiming that it's super cool you're seeing the world, but really it's because you have a, a real challenge forming deep relationships because you have some unresolved things, then like what's just a fun adventure could also be a real escape. Mm. You, know, you don't have to be a digital so wise. to do that. You, you could, you could yeah. do other activities that seem on the outside like that guy's super productive. Wow, he's got such a good work ethic. Well, he uses work as a complete escape uh, and actually has real problems with relationships in his life, uh, whether romantic or, or personal or familial, you know. Um, oh, well, you know, you can even read too much. Like, you know, reading can be an escape. It's like a drug. Everything's kind of a drug, like people, places, mm. you know, and actually knowing how to dose yourself accordingly, be mindful with how you um, prescribe yourself people, places, activities, just the same as substances, you know, uh, and, and why, if you're doing something too much, what's behind that and what maybe you have to look at, you know? So that's why I said it was a, a deep answer to a relatively what seemed on the surface, like a simple question. Yeah. Thank you. Because I noticed you brought it up a few times and I want to make sure, you know, we kind of touch on like what it means. Right. Um, and I love everything that came from it, which is like just even the philosophical kind of like, am I doing it for the right reason? Am right. I like, or anything we do, we can excessively digitally nomad or right. even excessively read. Like if I'm not, like you said, you like to write, you like to document. I mean, that's really helpful because it kind of balances the excessive, like if you're always inputting, you also need some output, right? Totally. If you're always outputting, you need input. So like you need to be yes. balancing these like uh, two and to digest something, it's like you have to chew. How do yeah. you chew? You write, you like reflect, you have to go, maybe you have a conversation with somebody, but you can't just digest it if you don't chew. Yep. 
You're right. I mean, and actually it's funny because I think back to that little dictaphone my mom gave me when I was so young, when I read the manual about, because um, because now every week I'll do a uh, at least a half hour audio journal with myself. Uh, I don't have, I don't write as much, especially not by hand. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't have quite the capacity. I'm often sitting at the laptop already so much for work that actually having a voice recording of this week of how my feelings are and I can do that while walking or hiking or lying down mm. or whatever cooking um is a great way for me to process it's almost like talk therapy with myself you know yeah and then when you listen to it you're like oh yeah and if you even listen to it sometimes like the same way with like the artist pages sometimes it's just about like you say it's almost like getting it out it's like dreaming yeah. it's like cleaning an aspect of your brain it's flushing something out which is what they yeah. think dreaming is doing. It's actually a very important process for like a healthy brain, um, enough sleep and dreaming. And similarly with audio journaling, it's like shit, so much happened this week. I just need to like speak it out. I might even never even listen to this, but um, it's all backed up to my Google cloud. So one day I've been doing it for like six years and half an hour every week, at least, you know, like it's going to be, I'm mean, now with AI, maybe actually I could parse that for some pretty interesting, I've been putting yeah, my journals David, into AI no. and asking it about my psychological state and insights into my character, what I can do about it. I mean, you know, I'm not just using all this AI stuff for work. I'm using it for really some fun. That fun is amazing. Tools, you know, oh my God. We have to talk ourselves. more about this. <laughs> is there anything we didn't talk about that you'd like to share? Um. Yeah, I mean, I guess we should bring it back to some degree to, um, you know, this philosophy. Of, I think a, there's a, been a thread that's interesting of like AI we've talked a lot about of design and iterations of kind of our shadows and our light of our storytelling. Um, and there's a thread. And I think that on a, mi a micro level, we're feeling it. And on a macro level, we're feeling it. And there's a great deal of like anxiety uh, post COVID, we've gone into a world that I think's never really recovered from it. And all that anxiety and tension is being brought into a lot of people's lives on an individual level, but also on a macro level. You know, world leaders, don't forget, they went through COVID too. And if you're feeling anxious and having a hard time uh, adapting post COVID, they are too, right? And yet they're world leaders. Coming back to like, what are you doing? Are you doing things with heart? What you're creating in life, whether it's a UX, UI project, or whether it's like, uh, you know, a vision for the future of your city or country, right? As a leader, like, are you really coming at it with heart? Are we pivoting? Like, you know, are we accepting the things that really were crappy? And these are aspects of whether it's the climate or, you know, um, others, you know, political tensions or civil unrest. It's like things are, there's a lot of things that aren't working. Well, how can we pivot onto that? When I did a permaculture course, it was all about acknowledge, you have five minutes to acknowledge the problem. The rest of the class is going to be all about focusing on solutions, right? And I think that that's the right balance is like acknowledge the problem, but move on to mm -hmm. solutions. If you're just complaining about things, um, you're not being part of the solution, right? Uh, if you're complaining about uh, if you're complaining about whatever it is, your political ideas or, or your thoughts about like this, that, or the other, well, what are you doing to help it mm -hmm. out? Are you just upsetting yourself and friends, right? Um, you know, so that's on uh, something I like to come back to a lot. It's like, how are you being part of the solution and being part of the story that you want to tell? Mm. You know, my motorcycle uh, teacher said, hey, if, like, if you're looking in the ditch while you're trying to learn how to ride a, ride a motorcycle, you're going to end up in the ditch. And that's the same, that metaphor works for individuals. <laughs> Just the same thing with the storytelling of like, how are we doing with our storytelling? Mm. What maybe in our lives has been good or not good or not expected? That works on a, a larger level in terms of like AI. Like, yeah, you're, there's a lot of bitching going on about it. It's here, okay? It's not going back. The genie's not going back in the bottle. Do you want to adapt and figure out how to coexist and in fact flourish and be creative and live a deeply fulfilled life where AI could possibly really help? Or you want to start telling stories about how it's everybody's downfall? Do you want to actually be part of building the very thing you're afraid of? Because guess what? By telling everybody the story, by being fearful of it, you're helping usher in that reality, right? So yeah. you have responsibility. And then even on the largest level, you know, like how are we telling the stories in our culture? Mm -hmm. So much comes back to story. Because if constantly we're just telling dystopian stories about how everything goes to hell, we're gonna recreate it for ourselves. Um, and, you know, we have the danger of really creating it on a large level now, more connected and empowered than we ever have been. So it's more important than ever to be around people and 
working with clients and in our relationships on helping tr people try to improve the stories that we're telling for ourselves and for our world. Mm. That's what I would say. So hopefully that wasn't too big of a, <laughs> a final point, but I think- that No, was, that was that great. Was it was amazing. <laughs> thank you so much, Dougie. I'm gonna just hit the pause and thank you again for sharing everything you shared. I love it, love it, love it. You're just it was the a best. Pleasure. Thanks so much. Thank I really so appreciate much. it, Tara's.